Hello everyone and welcome back to another day of our 30 day biology study challenge. Today we're on day 29 and we're going to be talking about biodiversity. Remember to stay tuned for the entire lesson so that we can do some content review and some active studying at the end. And we are almost done with our 30 days. So if you've made it this far, congratulations. There's just one more day to go after this. Let's get started. So biodiversity in general is just the variety of life on earth. There are countless species literally on planet earth and so many we have not discovered. But a lot of times when we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about species biodiversity, which is a measure of the variety of different species in an ecosystem. So an ecosystem with very few different number of species has low biodiversity and an ecosystem with very many different species has high biodiversity. We can also talk about things like genetic biodiversity, which is the genetic differences among individuals within the same population. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to be mostly talking about species biodiversity when I say biodiversity. The higher an ecosystem's biodiversity, the more resilient it is to changes in the environment. And so we often say the more biodiversity an ecosystem has, the healthier it is. Ecosystems with lower biodiversity and just fewer parts to them are often more susceptible to things like disease. When one disease wipes out a particular population, if there's only a few species in that ecosystem, it could have devastating effects on the entire area. These areas are often less resilient to other changes as well. So why do we care about biodiversity besides saying that an ecosystem with higher biodiversity is healthier? Well, mostly it's due to the fact that humans rely on other organisms for almost everything, for products, for medication, for the supplies we need to build and construct things, timber, fibers, adhesives, rubbers, all of these products come from things that were once living. Many prescription drugs that have been developed come from wild species, and there's so many more species that haven't been studied that have huge medical potential. Other species could be indicators of changes within an environment, of toxins, for example, and when we notice if population levels of certain species rise or fall, this could be an indicator of bigger problems within an ecosystem. Now we know that every species occupies a particular niche within an ecosystem, or specific role that it plays, but some organisms may have a greater impact on a particular ecosystem and its stability than others. And so we call these often keystone species. The wolves from Yellowstone Park are often used as an example of a keystone species, even though there's been some debate recently about other organisms that may be just as important to the balance of that particular ecosystem. In general, we know that climates with warmer and wetter conditions uh, have higher biodiversity. So abiotic factors can influence the biodiversity of an area as well. So if you think of a typical rainforest, with very high temperatures on average throughout the year and high levels of rainfall, these typically have the highest levels of biodiversity on the planet. Then you compare that to something like the Arctic tundra, while not completely barren, there's plenty of species that are able to survive in the tundra. It's fewer than the rainforest, which has conditions that support a greater variety of life. Now, there are lots of different ways to measure biodiversity. There are different biodiversity indices, or a biodiversity index is one way to quantify the levels of biodiversity in area. And of course, we can't go and count every single species in every area. So often what scientists do is ecological sampling, where they use a portion or a piece that's a representation of the whole ecosystem. But let's just take a look at this real quick. These are hypothetical species represented by dots. Every color represents a different species. And in each of these ecosystems, we have 24 different individuals. So to calculate biodiversity for each of these, we would take the number of different species and divide it by the number of individual organisms in the ecosystem. System. So here we just have one color, so that's one specific species out of 24 different organisms. In the second environment, we have seven different colors out of 24 different organisms. And here we have nine different colors out of 24 different organisms. And here we have five different colors, which means five different species out of 24 different organisms. So if we did the math, we would see that this ecosystem here had the highest biodiversity using this particular calculation. Now, if you continue to study biology, you look at it in college, you get into AP environmental science, you'll see that there are other ways to calculate biodiversity. So Simpson's biodiversity index is one, Shannon Wiener is another. There's even calculations for species evenness and species richness in an area. And all of these serve a different purpose for different scientists looking for different things. So let's get back to these hypothetical different ecosystems here. And let's just see an impact of a disease on one species in particular. So let's say a species is impacted by a disease. It starts with 
one individual here. And so that line crossed, that's going to represent the individual that's affected by the disease. And what's going to happen is that disease might spread to any individuals that are within close proximity to the original infected individual. And so what happens is that individual dies, as does any of them of the same species in that same. And so any of them that are touching or surrounding this individual that first got infected will die off as well. So let's see what happens to those ecosystems. So our first ecosystem entirely wiped out. There's just one species, all of the individuals are dead. This particular ecosystem is pretty heavily affected as well. Uh, these two did not come out so bad. So this one here, although it did have a number of individuals of that green species, we can see that it was also surrounded by a many different types of species. So the disease did not get as far and we have a lot of surviving individuals as did this ecosystem here. So these dots are just a little hypothetical, but when we look at real life ecosystems, the dots could be stand-ins for tree species. And so we've seen situations similar to this happen in real ecosystems where we have trees like conifer, for example, it's affected by a particular disease and then the conifers in the ecosystem are all wiped out because the disease can travel from individual to individual very quickly. So when we talk about these changes that ecosystems are resistant to, um, some of them can be natural. So they can be droughts, flooding, earthquakes, other catastrophic events, wildfires, uh, climate changes, in addition of excess nutrients to a system, which is eutrophication. All of these are large scale changes that can influence the biodiversity of an ecosystem. And in tomorrow's video, we're gonna be talking more specifically about the human impacts and disruptions to ecosystems that are caused by humans. So before we move on to that, let's do some practice questions specifically about biodiversity. As we go through these, feel free to pause me, meet me, go at your own pace. These are for you to practice these topics in the way that best fits your needs. Okay, number one, an ecosystem is most likely to remain stable if it has high levels of A, predators, B, invasive species, C, biodiversity, or D, carbon. Think about it. Correct answer is C, biodiversity. Hopefully this one was a gimme since this whole video has been on biodiversity, but the higher the biodiversity, the more resilient it is to change and it's more likely to remain stable over time. Number two, a tropical rainforest was cut down to plant a coffee plantation. What will this do to the biodiversity of the rainforest? A, the biodiversity will increase, B, the biodiversity will decrease, C, the biodiversity will stay the same, or D, all species will go extinct. Think about it. Correct answer is B, the biodiversity will decrease. So there may be a number of new species in the area if the plantation is large and there are many coffee plants that are planted there, but even if the number of plant species stayed the same, the biodiversity would certainly decrease because we have fewer components in the ecosystem, fewer different species. All right, number three, true or false, there is only one way to measure biodiversity. Think about it. Correct answer is false. There is There are many ways to measure biodiversity. It really depends on what you're looking for. And you'll probably get into some of the more complex calculations as you move forward or go and take more biology courses later on. Number four, the climate of an ecosystem is dry and cold. What is likely the biodiversity of the area? A, high, B, medium, C, low, or D, zero, no life can survive in a dry, cold climate. Think about it. Correct answer is? C, low. So we said it's an ecosystem, so there's definitely life there. It's not somewhere on Mars, um, but it is likely lower and probably low. Uh, remember that wetter, warmer environments are gonna have higher biodiversity than colder, drier environments. All right. Thanks so much for sticking with us on day 29. Tomorrow is our final day, day 30, human impact. So if you've stuck with us this far, thanks so much for watching. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.